Hi, this is Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us today for Live with Annie. As usual, we've started the stream a bit early. This helps us get everything set up and broadcasting properly to our various platforms. You can find a countdown clock on the screen showing how long it will be until we actually go live. While you wait, please connect with us and other viewers in the chat. Let us know where you are from and whether you're a new or longtime viewer. We'll see you live soon. again for joining us for Live with Annie. We are so happy to have you with us today. While you wait for the program to start, we hope you'll enjoy the content playing on screen. There's so much inspiration, so take a moment to tell us what you love in the chat. Don't forget there is a countdown clock on the screen so you know how long until we go live.
It's Annie again reminding you that we'll be going live with this week's episode shortly. There is a countdown clock on the screen showing how much time is left. You've got just enough time to grab some water or a beverage of your choice and a snack and to connect with us in the chat. We'd love to hear what you've been working on this week. It's Annie, back to remind you that we'll be starting this week's live very shortly. We've got a really fun episode planned for today, and we'll see you soon. I'm Annie of ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie. Thank you so much for joining us for episode 16 of season 4 of Live with Annie. Today we are being joined by Joanne Banco of Let's Go Sew. Joanne will share lots of tips and tricks for using sewing machine feet and accessories when making by Annie projects, so stay tuned. I'm happy to be back on live after a delightful trip to Denver to teach at Pink Door Fabrics Sew Fancy Retreat and to pre present a lecture at Above and Beyond Sewing in Thornton. 
It was really nice to take a bit of a break from my usual routine, and being able to spend time with other makers is always so much fun. I enjoyed meeting lots of regular Biani viewers and hope to meet even more of you in person one day soon. In the meantime, we're really happy to have the opportunity to share time with you each week on Live with Annie. If you enjoy these episodes, please take a minute to follow us wherever you are watching. And if you know someone else who you think might enjoy the information that we share, we would really love it if you would tell them about Live with Annie. The easiest way to do that is to just tag them while you're watching. That will take them directly to the episode so they can watch it too. And as always, we love reading your comments, so please be sure to interact with us throughout this presentation. Tell us what you think about what we're showing, share your tips and tricks, and tell us the projects you're working on. We want to know what you think, and we really love learning from you too. If you've got any questions, put them in the comments or chat, and we will do our best to answer them before we close. So for the past two weeks, Casey filled in for me on Live with Annie, sharing tips for using our new website. He talked about how to log in, find your add-on videos, place orders, and more. If you missed those episodes or want to watch them again, remember that you can find all the previous 152 episodes of Live with Annie on our Facebook page, our YouTube channel, or at byannie.com. And we've put up all the links to make them easy for you to find. I have heard lots of positive reviews on the new website, and I hope that you are all enjoying its new features. Casey asked me to let you know that they fixed the problem with the case-sensitive passwords, so if you have a password that has both uppercase and lowercase letters, you should be good to go. Note that the system will default to change everything to lowercase, but you can type it in either way. Also keep in mind that the digital library has been replaced by a learning tab and courses, and that's where you're going to find the Biani basics, patterns, and add-on videos, all your other add-on videos, previous episodes of Live with Annie, and lots more. So if the website is new to you, we suggest that you join the course called Get the Most Out of Biani.com for an introduction to many of the new features. Another really helpful course is titled Helpful Resources, and you'll find lots of helpful information there. There's PDFs with our circle templates, our zipper colored card. You'll find a chart showing the colors of SoFine thread and Aurofil thread that match our zippers and mesh. Tutorials for using mesh and magnets, all kinds of stuff there. So that's a really great one. One of the things that I like best about the new website is the ability to search more than just products. So for example, if I type stiletto into the search box, the system returns several results. You're going to find a link to our Biani Stiletto and Pressing Tool product. That's always right at the top if there's a product. Then a course on how to use the stiletto and a variety of blog posts relating to it. If you type needle into the box, you'll find links to a handy needle case, our needle case and wool pincushion pattern, our favorite top stitch needles, and lots of other helpful videos and articles about needles, threads, and more. So this search function makes it so much easier to find additional information about our products and video tutorials. So really take some time to explore and learn. I need a drink of water before I keep going here. So another really fun place to visit is the Community tab. And this is where you're going to find photos from the monthly photo contest and a gallery of Biani models and much more. Um, before we move on to today's topic, I do want to give a quick shout out to the March winter winners in the Adapt a Biani Pattern Challenge. So Ruth C. was the winner of this month's Storyteller Award. And you won't want to miss her story on how and why she adapted our just-in-case pattern to make carriers for her embroidery hoops. So if you've ever made just-in-case or seen the pattern, it makes fold-over bags in two small sizes. So as you can see, Ruth really enlarged them to hold her embroidery hoops. And in addition to changing the size, she also added carrying straps, exterior pockets, embroidered pockets, hook-and-loop tabs, and more. So she went all out. 
I also loved seeing how Abby H. adapted our free pattern Just Desserts. That pattern is designed to hold a container of ice cream, and she changed it to hold threads and fabric leaders near her machine and uses a pincushion. So be sure to read Abby's post in the photo contest because she shares lots of good information about how she adapted it to make her weighted pincushion and holder. Also check out this amazing A Place for Everything 2.0 that Valerie C. made. She incorporated 12 different fabrics and a variety of colors of Biani zippers, mesh, and fold-over elastic create, to create a really cheerful bag. And to ensure that her bag would truly be one of a kind, she incorporated cross-stitch designs into pockets on the front and back. She added a scissors pouch and a felt needle minder, and she included a custom storage pocket that was inspired by the running with scissors pattern on the inside of the front of the bag. Excuse me, I need another drink. And finally, here is an amazing tools of the trade made by Nicole W. In addition to a fun pieced border on the outer flap, Nicole added ribbon accents and she made her handles using webbing instead of fabric. On the inside, she added an extra flap with zipper pockets, as well as another sleeve with more pockets for storage. Nicole always does really beautiful work, and I am really looking forward to having her as a guest on Live with Annie in August, so be sure and watch for that. Thank you again to everyone who took the challenge to adapt a Biani pattern. I have really enjoyed your, seeing your creativity, and I can't wait to see um, what you do next. We've got some more challenge ideas up our sleeves, and we'll share some more information about those soon. All right. So right now, though, I want to tell you about the special guest who is joining us today. Joanne Benko is a freelance sewing educator an online instructor, and a brother ambassador. She has a very popular YouTube channel on which she shares all kinds of tips to help you make the most of your sewing and embroidery machine. Her calm and encouraging manner and her cheerful way of sharing her knowledge will teach and inspire you to create beautiful items for yourself or others. So please help me welcome Joanne Banco. Hey, Annie, so good hey. to be with you today. I am so glad to see you too. I'm glad that you're feeling better and able to be here th this week. I had, have to say I've always had a really great time being a guest on your show, Let's Go Sew, and so it's really fun for me to turn the table this time and have you share your tips and tricks with our audience too. So before we well, get started on that, I thought maybe you could tell us just a little bit about your background and history and how you got started in this industry. Sure thing. Let's take those glasses off for just a minute. Um, I actually uh, started sewing in junior high. Uh, never took a stitch before my first uh, sewing required class in junior high. I can remember that first stitch like it was yesterday. It was truly love at first stitch and I just wanted to keep sewing. Well, my mother was um, very encouraging and what happened is she the next year, um, I was obviously going to uh, go back for my next year of school, and I was going to have sewing again. And she said, you know, I have an idea. Instead of shopping for school clothes, how would you like to shop for a sewing machine instead? Now, there was a catch to it, though. My mother was a what she said she did type person. And she said, if you purchase this, if we purchase the sewing machine and you buy fabric, you have to make your school clothes that year. So I chose the machine and the rest is history. So I thank my mom so much for giving me that gift. Um, I literally never stopped. I took sewing all through high school. I was able to take extra uh, electives. And then I actually got a job uh, while I was still in school at a custom drapery factory using industrial machines. We made very high-end drapes for uh, decorator customers and, and high-end uh, department stores. And then after I graduated from high school, I went to fashion school in Cleveland. It was called uh, Progressive Fashion. Learned the nitty gritty of pattern making and uh, pattern alterations and uh, really fine tuned my skills by learning custom sewing and factory sewing methods as well. So I think it mostly what it did is it taught me how to, how to learn and hopefully then um, I was able to translate that into 
how to teach. So eventually I started working in a, um, a sewing machine dealership, uh, got associated with brother and became a brother educator and then uh, a brother ambassador, which basically means that I use their equipment um, ex you know, exclusively currently. And um, I really um, enjoy all of the all of the tools that we have at our at our uh, fingertips today. So that's what I want to share with you. Wow, that is, I loved hearing about you uh, making all your clothes and, and doing that. I, I, wh I grew up in a family of five girls and my dad was a minister who didn't make much money. So if you wanted a new dress, you had to sew it. And I remember making my bridal gown and all of that stuff. So it was really fun. But I loved especially hearing about what you learned in fashion school and also working with both industrial machines and and yeah. all of the techniques. So I am so excited to hear what you're going to share with us today. And I'm just going to turn it over to you. So take it away. Okay, I'm, I'm ready. Give me um, two seconds to just uh, switch my camera over. I'm gonna go over right over to the machine and you won't see me, but you will see the machine and all of the great accessory feet that I have lined up to show you today. So looks like you can see that pretty good. So I'm going to head over there and I've got just a batch of goodies for you today. I can't wait to share a whole variety of things that you can use in your own sewing repertoire to build your Biani bags. And I have to say, I consider myself um, a beginner Biani bag maker or um, uh, project maker. Uh, I've done a lot of construction in my day a lot of garment construction, a lot of um, uh, home decor, and a lot of craft items uh, as well. So I've dealt with a lot of the same type of principles that you're using in, in the bag making. But um, when I look at um, Biani patterns and Biani's tools and supplies, I just always think, what feet can I use to bring that all together to make your um, buy any bag making more enjoyable. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about embroidery. I do uh, love to do embroidery. So I've got an embroidered sample here. I've got a few embroidered samples that I'm going to show you. And the first one is done with a special feature that I have in this particular machine, which is a uh, fill stitch pattern. And uh, that just, uh, again, I'm a, a, a brother ambassador. I use brother equipment and I'm actually working on the brother uh, Luminaire 3 currently. And this particular piece is um, uh, an example of what you can do with the fancy fill stitches that are built into the machine. So I've actually added a monogram, but if you can think about your Biani projects and pieces and parts that you may want to customize with embroidery. If you have that capability, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So again, this is a specialty. This is called a fancy fill stitch. It happens to be built into the machine that I currently have, but um, there are other options. And other options for people that do have embroidery capability is the option to do what we call edge to edge quilting. And edge-to-edge -edge designs are uh, made in different formats so that you can use them on a wide variety of machines. Uh, the bigger the hoop you have, the larger the area that you can embroider at one time. But the characteristic that edge-to-edge -edge designs have is that they have a beginning point and an ending point. So I'm just gonna get my little thumbnail on there, beginning and ending or ending and beginning, whichever one this is, but when you use these, you actually link these designs together. So again, uh, to create as large of an area of what you want to embroider. So you can embroider very, very large pieces. In fact, you can embroider whole quilts with this particular technique and it's very foolproof and very, very easy to use. And again, um, these designs are available from a lot of different sources. If you search online, edge to edge quilting designs, uh, you will certainly find something that will uh, suit your particular machine when you, when you search for that. So it's just a, a really easy way to 
quilt quickly without you having to manually handle the fabric. And then the third one I have here is just ordinary stipple filling. And um, this also was done with an embroidery design um, with uh, an embroidery hoop, but it's just a simple fill pattern. These are also very popular. And with my particular machine that I'm using, I actually have this ability, uh, this capability built in that I can choose a stipple fill to fit any hoop that is in my repertoire. And I always like to recommend that if you are going to try this all over machine embroidered quilting technique, that you start with something really simple and then progress. So the simplest would be a stipple fill because if you stitched more stipple fill next to more stipple fill, it's really hard to tell where you started and where you stopped. And it's just very, very, very forgiving. Uh, I'm going to come back to this sample uh, in a minute and explain what I've got here on the edge. But give me, give me time to show you a few other things um, first. And I should say that I've got everything sandwiched with one layer of cotton. And I have used cotton batik. Now you could certainly use uh, any kind of fabric, even uh, fabric that you have pieced, uh, you know, you created patchwork. And then I've just used a, a backing of a uh, cream colored cotton sateen, but I've got my beautiful, wonderful, love it so much <laughs> by Annie Soft and Stable in the middle. So it just shows you what a gorgeous job, um, you know, and beautiful results you can get with the by Annie Soft and Stable replacing what we would traditionally use in a quilt, which would be batting. It's just a really beautiful way to get all of those pieces quilted quickly. So I'd love to know, I'll check chat later, um, if any of you have this capability. And uh, if you'd like to tell me if you're uh, already using it for your buy any bags. Now, of course, we have people who have long arm machines and they can do something uh, very similar to that look um, and create all over quilting as well. But I don't have a long arm. I've actually never done anything more on a long arm than uh, stitch out my my name. And uh, I am not a very good uh, free motion quilter. So actually, let me back up for just a minute because I wanted to mention a few things about free motion. So I'll go back to this stipple fill. Now, I don't know. I'd love to know in the chat again uh, how many of you are stipple fill stitchers on the sewing side of your machine. If you are, you're probably very familiar with a foot known as a darning foot. Uh, if you are new to this, this is a spring-loaded foot, and it actually, um, you know, kind of um, hops a little bit on your fabric and rests on the fabric when it's forming the stitch and then relaxes and eases off as you're moving around. And if you are good at free motion work, which means you can sew readily and easily forward and backward and side to side, you would be very um, well suited for using this foot. Uh, if you're good at drawing and you're you know, a little bit on the artistic side, if you're a doodler, I found that those people um, adapt themselves very quickly to stipple stitching and creating their own uh, fill patterns, which you can do with templates, you can do with, uh, um, there are, you know, just many, many different ways that you can mark your fabric and then stitch over it. I'm a bit uh, free motion challenged, so I'm not going to demonstrate free motion work for you today, but I, I do want to tell you about some of the different uh, feet options. So the spring-loaded, also known as a darning foot, is probably the most popular. And then the next one that you may see, I'll tell you about this one, is an echo quilting foot. And this foot has little rings on it that mark off uh, distances. So if I had a, a shape like a heart or anything like that, I would be able to, um, you know, follow that that uh, those concentric lines and swirl over whatever shape that I have and create an echo all around it. 
once again, I'm a little bit spoiled. I have uh, a feature called echo filtering in my embroidery machine. So I tend to um, default to that, but I did want to show you that foot. And then the next one is another free motion foot that is uh, very tiny. And I find that a lot of people like this for doing very detailed work. So if you're stitching on specific printed fabric and you're following the outline of your printed fabric with a, a free motion technique or you're following stripes and plaids and lines like that, um, this tiny foot gives you uh, just a, a really good close view of where you're stitching. So those are three feet that are very popular for free motion quilting. All right, next up, I'd like to talk about embroidering or quilting rather on the not embroidery side of your machine, but on the sewing side of your machine. So the samples that I'm showing you now uh, that I just finished with and I've got a uh, couple, three more here, were for, from a former show that Ann, uh, Annie and I did together on my Let's Go Sew with Joanne Banco YouTube channel. And Annie did a great project uh, with a tea cozy. And then I showed just a few samples of what I normally like to use um, to do my, my quilting. So the idea here is that we love to feature decorative stitches and it's always, you know, a challenge though to stitch them out on bulky fabrics. Uh, we're going to talk in just a minute about walking feet and uh, another um, type of uh, uh, dual feed foot that that helps even feeding. But many of the popular walking feet, such as this standard ordinary one here, they were not designed to sew decorative stitches. So if you did want to pre-quilt a large piece and incorporate decorative stitches and you wanted to use uh, a walking foot, you're going to have some difficulty with it moving across the fabric. In fact, I find that anytime I have a lot of bulk or kind of that, that squishiness that you have with the um, soft and stable, that uh, the decorative stitches can get sort of hung up. So my big tip for you here is to stabilize your fabric with an ordinary tearaway stabilizer just with the tearaway and the single layer of fabric. Don't make your sandwich yet with your Biani Soft and Stable. Go ahead and use your favorite decorative stitch foot. Uh, for me that tends to be this one right here. I have a what's called an enhanced end foot. And my enhanced end foot allows me to um, stitch out decorative stitches very smooth and very easy. It's got a, a very large wide foot and it also has a slick coating on the bottom. So it slides over the uh, fabric really easy. And then it actually snaps on, but it also connects um, on the shank right here so that it has a nice uh, tight hold. So this is a new foot. If you have a similar machine to mine, uh, uh, any of the, the brother machines um, uh, that will take this foot, you will find it's a great foot. So what I did is I stitched out those decorative lines of stitching just on the fabric and the stabilizer. And then I created my quilt sandwich with my soft and stable and my backing. And then I used a walking foot to stitch the decorative um, actual quilting stitches were just a straight stitch. Again, a walking foot is in most cases, unless you have one that's specialized, and I will talk about that in a minute, but if, unless you have one that's specialized and your particular manufacturer recommends it, walking feet are designed for straight stitching and zigzag. So my straight stitches that I've added here, I have added through all three layers. So I get a quilted fabric with a kind of a faux uh, look of that decorative stitching because it's not going through both sides. And then I'm assured of um, perfection in my uh, well-stabilized fabric and my, my decorative stitches. So I love using this to create large sections of fabric. And then just like we do for all of the Biani projects, um, you know, pre-cut it and uh, 
and then it's ready for you to uh, incorporate into your project. Now, I have one more really fun one here that I wanna show you, and that is quilting in a crosshatch manner with a twin needle. So for this, simply I threaded the machine with two colors of thread. I've got pink and green here, and I have a twin needle. So I've got each one of those threaded in each one of those needles. And then when you use a twin needle, it shares the bobbin thread. So it creates kind of a zigzaggy look on the, on the bottom side. And, um, you know, that's certainly the top side is, is, the, is the prettiest. But a serpentine stitch is, if you look, just kind of concentrate on the stitch itself, it's just a stitch that forms a wave, kind of an undulating stitch. And lo and behold, when you stitch it in a crosshatch manner, it just forms almost this, this beautiful kind of shell effect. And it, it's really, really a fun and unusual way to quilt your fabric. So I know I've got um, both beginner and advanced by Annie bag makers watching here. I hope that um, if not up till now, um, by the time we finish, you will come across some tips and techniques that you can start to incorporate in your um, beautiful by any projects. All right, last here, as far as quilting on the sewing side of the machine, is my standard crosshatch quilting. So crosshatch quilting, very simply, I'll show you how I start mine. And I'm actually gonna um, stitch this with a special foot. I simply make an X. So whether my fabric is a square, a rectangle, a small piece, big piece, Whatever it is, I start by simply marking off from point to point uh, on both ends and creating an X in the fabric. And then that way I can continue multiple lines evenly spaced. And I'll give you a, a couple options for that and create my own very beautiful diamond quilted um, fabric. Now, of course, you could do this in straight lines as well, but this is by far my favorite. It just, it looks good with everything. It has a very professional finish. And if you follow um, some of my directions here, I think you'll find that you can create a very accurate um, grid with that. So this particular one was stitched with one of my favorite threads. It's a Wonderfill uh, 12 weight thread and it happens to be variegated and it just really makes a, a nice pretty effect. Now you've noticed thus far I've been using just plain fabrics and that's because it's really one of my favorite ways to uh, embellish a, a bag is just with a plain fabric and then the let the the decorative stitching speak but you can certainly use these techniques on your printed fabrics as well. So no problem there just follow along the the same way. All right, so I want to talk a little bit now about the actual quilting process. So in the quilting process, uh, you have a, a variety of, of options. I know Annie and I were chatting a little bit, and Annie likes to use her standard quarter-inch foot um, to do uh, her quilting, and that's that that works perfectly fine. You could also consider using your standard um, sewing foot that's designed for zigzag and straight stitching. Uh, I like to use a regular foot when I'm doing small pieces. It works out just fine. But when I'm doing larger pieces, I really enjoy using uh, some sort of an even feed foot. It really gives me a great finished look. And I didn't bring any samples with me today of what I'm gonna say next, but you know we're working with um, cottons very often um, and cotton likes to stick to the soft and stable and that's a wonderful thing. But is there anybody saying that you can't make bags out of silks and satins? You absolutely can. And in particular, if you're working on some of those more slippery fabrics, you're gonna really, really benefit from using uh, a a dual feed or an even feed type foot. So I'm gonna do what Annie does right now and stop here for just a minute for a drink. And I actually see my lovely 
computer did an update for me while I was talking. So I'm going to bring up real quick my um, screen again so I can see what's going on here. And hopefully it'll come back to where I left off. That's always a fun thing when your computer does updates for you at the least preferred moment. So let me see if that comes back up. All right, while that's coming back up, let's talk about a walking foot. A standard, normal, ordinary, everyday, average walking foot looks like this. Put it in front of the fabric so that you can see it good. Looks like this. And they do generally come in two versions. One version would be an open toe, which means this area in front of the needle is completely open. And then you may also find a, a closed toe version. And a closed toe version, just keep in mind with that extra uh, metal closed up there, uh, it does give you a little bit more pressure on your fabric. And that may be preferred when you're um, sewing things that need a little bit more uh, precision. But if you wanna be able to see your quilting lines as you're stitching them, then you probably want to work with the open toe foot because you can see that. My open toe foot here has a red dash line right in the center. So as I'm sewing, if I keep my eye lined up with the dash line and the line that I've drawn, and by the way, uh, I don't know what you like to draw your lines with, but there are many, many, many options available. My best tip for you on marking your fabric is three words, test, 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 and I'll say it again, it's always best to test. Take your marker, mark it on a scrap piece of fabric, and then launder that as you would normally launder it, remove the mark as instructed on the package instructions, um, and uh, see what the results are, because different fabrics will react differently, and you always want to be safe rather than sorry. So um, be sure that you test test your markers at all at all times. All right, so the, back to this walking foot. This walking foot has the ability for us to put in a quilting guide. So the, the reason I only mark two lines to start with is because my quilting guide can be set whatever distance from the needle I prefer, and each subsequent line of stitching can then be evenly spaced, which I will show you how I do that in just a minute. But let me talk about one additional type of walking foot. It's kind of a new kid on the block, and you may want to explore the options. Again, I'm showing you um, some feet that are specialty feet, but many of these feet uh, can be found in whatever manufacturer uh, you have. So I always recommend you check with your sewing machine shop, check with your dealer and see what they have uh, that would give you an, an option. This foot is called a dynamic walking foot. And it, the reason it's dynamic is because it is very solidly built. And because it's so well built, it means that it can take a little bit more abuse. Um, the regular walking feet, again, are designed for straight and zigzag, but this walking foot actually allows me to do some decorative stitches. So you'd wanna check with the instructions and see what it allows for. But again, then it has that, that specialty guide. Now, this foot was designed for a low shank. And you do always wanna check what your uh, presser foot shank is before you purchase a foot. My regular presser foot is a high shank. I don't know if you can see the difference there, but it's a little bit higher. So if I am needing to use a low shank foot, I actually have to put an adapter on. But the adapter with this low shank will bring it up to a high shank and set me perfectly on my machine. All right, the next one here is the digital dual feed foot. And this is a very special, unique foot. What's different about this foot is instead of walking with teeth, it rolls with a belt. So there's actually a belt mechanism built in. And not only does it roll with a belt, it actually allows us on the settings of the machine to change the speed of that belt. 
So we can start at a neutral position, which is just kind of standard, average, ordinary, or we can make this belt go faster. When the belt goes faster, it eases your fabric in. So again, if you're working maybe with more slippery fabrics or doing a large piece and you find that you're getting a lot of shifting, um, a regular walking foot will definitely help. But I like to call this a walking foot with superpowers. And it doesn't ever leave the fabric unless you tell it to by changing the little dial here on the side. If you want to release that, that uh, uh, belt, you can. But when you have that engaged, it's going to make constant contact with the fabric as opposed to a walking foot, which has to have the teeth go up and down as the stitch is being formed. So you'll notice this foot has a plug. And that's one of the ways you know if your machine is uh, fitted for this or not. And again, I recommend you go to your dealer and ask if they um, have a comparable um, dual feed belt driven foot that you can use. When this is plugged in, it allows me to access the setting mode on the machine and tell it if I want that um, belt to move faster or slower. So why would you ever want it to move slower? Well, again, if you're working with different, uh, different layers and different types of fabrics, sometimes you want that fabric to be just pulled a little more taut on the top. Sometimes you need it to be eased. If you need your fabric to be eased in, you use that belt at a faster speed and you have to experiment with it. But if you need your fabric to be stretched, you use that belt at a slower speed. And when the, the belt is going slower, it creates a slight stretching effect. So how do you know what you need? Well, I recommend that you cut strips of fabric exactly the same as what you're going to use in your project. Make them at least 10, 12 inches long and uh, just a you know, couple inches wide and do a test. If your fabric comes up uh, you know, short, then it means um, that you need to stretch it a little bit. If your fabric comes out with too much at the end, then it means you need to ease it a little bit. And again, it's a specialty foot, but it comes in really, really handy. And I will be showing you this in just a minute. But before we move on to that, I wanna backtrack, grab one of my little samples that I threw on the floor here. And I wanna show you one of my favorite techniques for working with the pre-cut pieces. Um, I'll stop and take another drink of water. After watching Annie on so many of her videos, I'd say she knows how to do it right. It would be nice if we could program music to play for that brief second while you're drinking water, <laughs> but it really, really helps. So this is, um, we're gonna pretend, oh, and by the way, that dual feed foot comes with all kinds of other optional accessories. I can get a stitch in the ditch foot. I can get a quarter inch foot. I can get a, a, an edge, um, a quarter inch foot, edge foot. Um, I just have a whole lot of options for these, these feet as well as the um, dynamic foot. So again, check your sewing machine shop to see what they have available. This particular foot allows me to snap off the closed toe and snap on an open toe, if I can see it. There we go. So I have that option with both of them, um, all in that, one, in that one featured foot. All right, so again, let's pretend we have got our pieces cut. That's common in the Buy Any projects, right? We pre-quilt our whole piece, we pre-prepare our whole piece, and I'm gonna give you some tips for uh, alternative ideas for quilting um, at the very end here. But if we're pre-quilting our piece, then we are cutting it to size. Well, I don't know about you, but I don't always get my projects done from start to finish. So in, in one short period of time. So you may be handling that fabric and then storing it again, and then handling it again and storing it again. Or you may be working with fabric that ravels a little bit more than you would like. So I've got a great tip for you I'd like you to see. I call this zigzag basting. And what I do is I change my presser foot to my overcasting foot. So I'm gonna snap this off for just a minute so that you can see it. Hopefully you can see that good there. And my overcasting foot uh, kind of, uh, 
helps me make a mock serger stitch. And with a serger, you know, we always have a little pin that the threads wrap around and we have a guide area where we um, follow along the raw edge. Well, that's exactly how this overcasting foot was designed. So I snap this on, pull a little bit of extra sewing thread there. And then I set my zigzag for, I'll give you the, my exact width and length, just an ordinary standard zigzag. I have it set for a width of 2.5 and a length of 4.5. I'm going to lower my presser foot, and I want you to see the magic of this. I am going to not only control the raveling fabric, and of course my by Annie stiletto comes in so handy for easing that fabric in. So not only is it going to control the ravels, it's also going to compact those layers. So that is a big, big bonus when you're working with some of the By Annie projects where you wish you could just, you know, kind of control that, um, that fullness there. We like to use, you know, clips to hold, hold our layers together, and that does help compress it. But this zigzag basting, I hope you can see, um, I'll, I'll show it on the edge there. It literally compressed that edge controlled all the raveling, and this would keep my piece from raveling further while I take my time putting that project together. And then let's look at, you know, you can see how much more thickness there is on the side that is not compressed. So uncompressed and then compressed. I love using this particular technique. I use it on a lot of projects. Almost any time I have pre-quilted fabric, I will um, take that extra little time and stitch along that edge. Now, obviously, you don't want to do that with um, fabric that is going to stare out at you or could possibly show through your layers. So a couple options for you on that. Either use fabric that blends in, which I did on this opposite side, or you could also consider using your favorite monofilament thread. Um, monofilament where well, you have to have a good a good brand a good quality but if you have a good quality monofilament it works very well for this by using the width of 2.5 and the length of 4.5 you are more you're, you're within your quarter inch seam allowance so it won't show through when you sew your actual seams in the bobbin i prefer to actually use bobbin weight embroidery thread and it comes in white it comes in black so I combine, if I want to make the most invisible stitch possible, the monofilament with the, um, the bobbin weight thread. It's a very fine, thin thread, so it doesn't, again, create bulk, and uh, it, it kind of disappears in your fabric. So white suits me fine for light-colored fabrics, and the black suits me fine for dark-colored fabrics. Same with the monofilament. The clear suits me fine for light fabrics, and the smoke color, which is also available, suits me fine for the darker fabrics. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and take off this foot, and I am going to take my shank off the machine, and I'm going to attach my digital dual feed foot, also known in the brother world as the move it foot. So we just simply wrap this foot around the shank, Screw it on there. I want to make sure that I've got it on where it should be. Of course, when you're working with a camera in between you and your machine is a little distance away, it's a little tricky. You get that firmly attached. And then I'm going to go ahead and plug it into the back. And I can just feel where that plug is. Um, again, there are many models that use this feature. I'm just going to test myself by raising that up and down. All right, so now I can go ahead. Again, I could zigzag base this either before or after I quilt it. I'm not going to try to be too perfect today. And the other thing that I love about the Biani projects is the way they're designed for you to um, quilt and then cut. So the first line of stitching, I'm just going to follow along. Actually, let me see if I have my other foot. 
uh, that I can use as a guide. Yes, I do. So I'm going to snap on my stitch in the ditch foot. These feet just snap off. And again, if you don't have this particular foot, um, stay tuned. I'm going to be showing you some more feet and options that you can use no matter what machine you have. But I think it's always good to know what is available because you never know what machine might be in your future. So I'm now going to go just to a regular straight stitch. I like to do my quilting generally at a stitch length of three, and I want my stitch to be right in the center. So I'm going to pick the center stitching position. And now if I didn't have this stitch in the ditch foot on, I would probably opt for um, an open toe. So when I talked about the quilting foot before, it would be the open toe. But this is going to give me a perfect sight line to follow. And again, I only need to do two of these to start with. So I'm going to go ahead and stitch this line. And I'm pretty sure I have my, my belt set for just standard average ordinary. I am not a, a fast stitcher. I prefer slow stitching whenever possible. The only time I did fast stitching was when I had to for doing those factory methods. But I think if you are a slow stitcher, you always have more accuracy. Now I'm going to cut my thread. Okay, and you can see my first line of stitching there is absolutely perfect on target. So I'm going to go ahead and do the second one. Thread loosened up just a little bit there. Let me get it down. I always like to start my stitching with my thread underneath my presser foot. And I do uh, generally, when I first start stitching, bring up my bobbin thread as well. And you saw me use the Biani um, uh, tool of a thousand uses to bring up my, my thread there. That tool really does have uh, a thousand uses. I love it for uh, not only helping to feed my fabric properly, but I also use it as a stitch ripper when I have to. So helps pull those stitches out. All right, so now I'm going to do that second row. I can maybe speed that up just a little bit. So when I'm watching this, my eye is simply following that center blade, or it would be the, the dot on the foot, you know, that would be where the opening is, and the marked line. That's all I'm looking at. Don't look at the needle. If you look at the needle, you're going to go sideways, or if you look elsewhere in the room. All right, so I've got my first two done. Now it's time to do all of the remaining lines of stitching for my cross hatching. Now I know some people like to do all in one direction at one time and all in the other direction um, next. I tend to alternate. Now I think when you alternate from one direction to the other, you have less movement in your fabric. But again, with the biani projects, you're pre-quilting and then um, cutting your excess away. So it's probably not, not as uh, critical there. But what I want to do now is I want to change to my guide. Again, I showed you the guides that were in the other feet, but I've got a guide here, and this is an optional accessory. Let me see, get that settled in there. I usually put this in before I put the machine on so I could see where I'm going. But I've got a little accessory that goes along with this that um, attaches to the foot and then allows me to add this guide. So now I can simply change the spacing. I'm gonna take this foot off now and just go back to my regular foot. Go ahead and use the open toe one here. I'm no longer going to be watching where my stitching is actually forming. I'm going to watch where my guide is following. So that looks like a pretty good distance. You know, you could measure with your measuring guide. And I'm just going to go with, with that. And then that just literally rides over the fabric. And you want to just keep that lined up.
Perfect spacing. Now I can go ahead and do the next line. It doesn't really matter where I go as long as I maintain that spacing. And I just keep quilting line after line after line until I have a completely full piece. Again, you do want to just um, you know watch that area right where that guide is and where your, your previous stitching is. Now I have another option on this machine. I'm just going to highlight really quick because if you have a machine like this, you may want to try using what we call a grid line. So we've got the ability to actually select, get in here in my um, machine, I've got a, a, a laser light built in and I can change the spacing. If you see, hopefully you can see that grid moving and I'm going to measure it until I get the same size that I have from that guideline. I think one more will do that just perfect. And now instead of using this guide, take that out, I'm simply following my previous line and lining up the grid line with that previous line. So this is a, a really cool feature. It's one of my favorite, favorite, favorite ways to make use of this specialized grid line that's built into the machine. So check again, check your manufacturer, check your machine to see if you have anything um, similar to this capability. All right, you see how perfect that comes out. And I could continue again, and I'm basically using a laser light instead of a guide to do all that. All right, we're gonna close out of there. We're gonna go to the next thing. I wanna talk a little bit about constructing um, your Biani projects and what you can use, get this turned off, to make your sewing life easier, happier, more fun, more carefree. I'm going to go ahead and take this foot off. Hope you enjoyed seeing the wonders of the digital dual feed foot. And I'm going to go back to just my regular foot holder. And I want to talk now about a foot that is available for just about every machine out there. And that is a straight stitch foot. So I'm going to grab my fabric again so that you can have a little contrast here. And a straight stitch foot, You, some of us um, remember the days when we sewed on a straight stitch only machine and we all thought that the stitch was so beautiful and so perfect on that. When we converted to zigzag, some of us found that we didn't get quite the stitch quality that we were used to. Well, that's actually a couple a couple different reasons. Um, one is the the straight stitch opening, but the other um, way that you can perfect your stitch is by using the right needle. So anytime you are working on a woven fabric, woven as opposed to knit, you always want to be working with a sharp needle. And I think the top stitch size 14, I think, is Annie's uh, favorite. We'll find out when we come back. Um, together, but that that is a great, great, great needle to use, and it's it's great for a couple reasons. Number one, it does have a larger eye. That's why it's called a top stitch needle, making it ideal for these thicker threads or just an embroidery type thread. Embroidery threads really need a larger eye to stitch properly and 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 make it foolproof. So that top stitch needle um, has that large eye. It also has a super sharp point. And whenever you have a super sharp point and you're piercing through a woven fabric, you get precision straight stitching. So you're always better off using um, a sharp needle on a woven fabric. A jeans needle is also a sharp needle. And sometimes when you need to size up, you then could go to the, um, to the 16 in a jeans needle. It's a very strong needle. Both of these are made from stronger metal than your standard um, sewing machine needles. All right, so what's so great about the straight stitch foot? Well, 
when a straight stitch foot is combined with a straight stitch plate, I actually have a pop-off plate on this machine. So I just simply pop it off like that and I can pop the straight stitch foot on, I mean, straight stitch plate on, pop on my straight stitch foot, put my bobbin case cover back on, and I have now a machine that functions like an old fashioned straight stitch. And what it does differently is instead of having all of this wiggle room in the zigzag throat plate opening, that wiggle room, we need it for zigzag, we need it for decorative stitching, but we really don't need it for straight stitching. And we always lack a little bit of support to our fabric when we have that large opening. So having a plate that has just a single hole, yours may come off by unscrewing it. It's like this one here. This is a straight stitch throat plate that, that um, comes off by unscrewing it. Um, it just, more metal, more closure gives more support. And when you're sewing some of those trickier, thicker places, you may wanna consider if you have the option of switching to a straight stitch foot. Now, my machine actually knows that I've got a um, straight stitch foot on it, except that it gets mad at me if I do it while the machine's on. So I gotta do a really quick reset there, okay, in order to use that, that particular foot. So again, uh, you can use that for anything. You can use it for construction. You can use it for quilting. It's also a foot that's a little bit more narrow. It's a, it's a little wider than a quarter inch, but not, not much. And it just gives a, a better amount of pressure to your sewing. So I'm just going to sew a straight little line of stitching on there. And you can see that the needle's just going down into that little hole. Go a little longer on my stitch length. And it, again, that's just that extra pressure and that extra closure there um, gives me a really uh, precise line of stitching. All right, I'm gonna cut that thread. I have more to tell you about here. So again, beautiful, beautiful straight stitch. Well, what about piecing? How many of you like to, again, I'm gonna have to turn the machine off real quick just so that it can reset when I pop this plate off. That is a safety feature, so you're not, um, getting your fingers in there with the machine on and it wants to be turned off. I'll snap that foot off and turn her back on. And I just have a few more things to talk about today. So what do we do when we want to create patchwork? Well, we want to create accurate patchwork. So we want to create precision seams. And that's where the quarter inch foot comes in so handy. Now, quarter inch feet are available for virtually every machine out there. Again, just check what works for you. Um, I actually prefer this foot with the guide, but it also, uh, you can get one without a guide. But what that's gonna do is help me create perfect quarter inch seams. When I snap this foot on, and I use a standard straight stitch in the center needle position. And I will tell you my favorite setting for piecing, if piecing is new to you, my favorite setting is using a stitch length of 1.8. I learned that from an expert quilter a long time ago. And if you use a stitch setting of a length of 1.8, it allows you to do chain piecing and never have to worry about your threads pulling out at the beginning or the end. So let's take a look at this. I'm gonna zoom in just a little bit for you so that you can see that. Hopefully you can see that really good. Are we zooming? There we go. Whoops, zoomed a little too much. It's very sensitive, that zoom. But I want you to see that my edge guide on my quarter inch foot is just along the raw edge of my fabric. So as long as I keep my two pieces 
with the raw edges matching. And I watch that guide. That guide forms like a fence. And that fence prevents me from going too far. It will give you the ultimate inaccuracy when you are piecing. Now, there also is a little bit of wiggle room in that opening. So if you need to stitch a scant quarter inch, you can do that. Uh, one of the best things you can do if you are trying to do real true precision is make a little sample block and measure it. If your um, piece doesn't measure the exact size block when you're finished, it probably means that you need to move your needle position slightly to give you a scant or a little bit less than a quarter of an inch. Fabric is always a variable. And again, you would use matching, fa matching thread. I just want you to see how perfect this forms a quarter inch patchwork. So I'm sure um, those of you that are watching, um, you maybe have your favorite quarter inch foot. I'd love to know if you have more than one quarter inch foot in your repertoire. This is a great way to make your own, again, special custom fabric. You can create a large block of fabric, press your fabric, and then uh, go ahead and quilt over it. Now, since I said the word press, I want to mention one more thing that is um, a favorite tool, but is not a, a foot. And it is called a clapper. If you have never used a clapper, you need to do yourself a favor and purchase one and see the beauty of pressing your seams and all of your edges with a wooden clapper. I've been using this for many, many years. In fashion school, we had these. And what it does is when you press your seam or you press any piece or you press in particular edges, we're gonna do straps here in a minute, you want to hold the clapper over the seam or over the pressed area for a few seconds. It holds the heat or the steam, if you use steam, and then the wood allows it to cool. And as it cools in just a few seconds, it helps literally pressure um, your fabric into position. And again, just try pressing without a clapper, try pressing with a clapper, you will immediately see the difference. So that's my quarter, quarter inch. All right, next up here, I want to do um, a little bit of binding on mesh. So I've got a foot that's called an adjustable bias binder. Now this takes a little bit of um, practice to use, but when I snap this foot on and I literally feed the binding into this bias binding foot and adjust it so that it closes up tight on it, I can now use this to completely stitch my biani elastic binding on. You want to leave yourself a little tail to start with. I didn't do that, so let me see if I can push some of that in. Give myself a little bit to catch on to. And I just have a preference um, when I do this, I like to use a slight zigzag stitch. Get that lined up there. And that just helps me um, catch that a little bit better. And you always, always, always want to do a sample. So let's see if I've got that started. If you um, find that it's a little bit tricky to get lined up, you can also move the foot towards the back. I just feed that in. There's a slot there for the top of the binding and the bottom of the binding. And then there's a slot for the mesh to go in the center. You want to have that tucked in there. And I know Annie always recommends that you do a little bit more at the beginning and at the end and then trim it to size. So you're if you're using this for pockets, you're going to oversize your pocket piece. But it just allows me to do that step really pretty fast, especially after you, like I said, you practice this a little bit. Okay. Pull this out so that you can see it with the foot attached. And you can see how that feeds in and you can see how that stitched that and anchored it on both sides. It's a little trickier to do with a uh, straight stitch. So I really like using a zigzag and that zigzag gives me a little bit of extra 
flexibility as well. I think it's time for another drink. And then I got just a couple more quick things to show you. Hopefully you're hanging with us in all this amount of time because I just have lots of information to share with you. All right. I have a fun way of creating straps. Now, I'm going to show you the by any way to create straps, which you can watch her videos on it. One way is to um, make a tube and then put your, uh, your webbing in. Another way is to fold your four-inch piece of fabric uh, with interfacing on that four-inch piece, fold it towards the center, fold it again, and then edge stitch along that edge. I am going to do that in a minute here. But I have another uh, little great trick to share with you. A friend of mine shared this with me because a friend of hers shared it with her. And what it is, is you take a one inch strip of Biani Soft and Stable. You cut your um, actual strap piece to measure three and three. Let me, let me double check it. I think it's three and three quarter inches wide. Yes, three and three quarter inches wide. Um, might be three and a half. I'll have to double check my measurement on that. I uh, don't have a, a really good accurate one handy. But you'll see when I when I do this what the, what the right width is. You cut your one inch piece of um, Biani Soft and Stable. You lay it right along one of the raw edges. Then you simply fold it over until that is entirely covered. In the second step, you take your opposite raw edge and fold it towards the left um, first folded piece with a just a slight little gap there. And you need that to kind of uh, take up the, the slack that you're going to have from this little bit of extra bulk. Then you do one more fold and you will now top stitch this entire piece. And by the way, this is a great place to use that clapper to get those nice crisp edges. But my fold ends up being almost in the center here. So when I top stitch from the opposite side, I will top stitch from the right edge, the left edge, and then right down the center. So how do I do accurate top stitching? Well, I could certainly do that with a regular foot. I can do that with an edge joining foot but I really love another foot that you may have never thought of using that again is readily available and that is an adjustable bias binder foot. It's designed for doing hems, but it's basically got a built-in edge guide so we can move that guide either closer to or further away from the needle. And it allows me to do edge stitching along that folded edge, whichever type of folded edge I'm using, and it allows me to stitch very, very close. So I'm going to pop this foot on, and I want you to see how this works. And we'll see where that's set for. Ideally, again, I'm just using a straight stitch, but ideally I want to stitch really close to that edge. And I'll just tell you why. The closer, you can do whatever you want. You can stitch a quarter of an inch. You can use your quarter inch foot. You can use your regular foot and move your needle position. Whatever works for you. But once you see this, I think you're going to want to try it. Because the theory here is the closer you are to the edge, the more customized your item looks. Um, when you look at ready to wear and you look at top stitching on ready to wear, it's always perfect and it's always perfect because they've got all kinds of uh, bells and whistles and tools and machines that do just one thing that will give them that perfection. You're going to get perfection by using different accessories. So I'm going to move the um, guide just a little bit so I have a little bit more fabric in there and I could see right where my needle is going to drop. Again, I always do a test. I'm going to go just a little further there. And I can also use this in combination with my needle position. So on most machines, it means we're changing the width. But if we're moving the needle over, it'll just adjust for that um, precise point where we want it. And again, I'm following the guide along the edge. 
gives me a fence, gives me a place to watch, and gives me absolute perfection. Wait till you see the finish on this. Look at that, how perfect and how accurate that is on both sides. All right, so we got one more little um, set of gadgets here for top stitching, and that is something called a bi-level foot, and maybe called a welt, uh, uh, a double weld foot. A lot of people use these for shirt making, but this foot actually has a ridge, and it's designed to accommodate thickness on one side of where you're stitching. So it comes in my world in a right and a left. And we'll go back to this puffy one now. And if I snap this foot on, so I'd love to know in the chat when I get to read it later if you're learning some new things here. That's, I don't know why that's not snapping on for me. Let's get that in position. some reason it's not happy with that. Maybe it's because I don't have any fabric underneath. Let's try it with fabric underneath. All right, so I can now put that so that the, um, the thicker side is running underneath the edge of the foot. This would be my lefty. And I want that toe falling right on the outside. I'm gonna go a little longer on my stitch length. Again, that's not only giving me a guide, it's also accommodating that thickness. Just like that, I've got a perfect, perfect finish for that. I would do another one on the edge and then one in the center, and I've got a well-formed strap without having to um, do any turning or, or uh, you know, turning inside out. All right, we want to do a couple more quick things because, again, I love to create my own fabric and embellish it um, even in other ways than just standard quilting. So I wonder how many of you are familiar with a foot called a braiding foot. And a braiding foot is just simply designed with a slot in the center and we can adjust the slot on this foot. I can go a little, um, a little tighter or a little looser. The looser I go, the wider my trim could be. I can do up to a quarter of an inch uh, ribbon on this and I can do soutache cord and all kinds of novelty cordings. But what this foot does is it holds the ribbon in place so that as I stitch, it is going to stay in exactly the position I need it. So I'm gonna lower the presser foot on that, and I'm gonna just use the width of my presser foot as a guide. You can select a zigzag stitch, or you can get a little fancy. I'm gonna get just a little fancy, and I'm gonna select a feather stitch. My ribbon is a little bit narrow, so I'm gonna narrow that feather stitch down a little bit. Again, you would want to do a sample, but what that foot is going to do is it's going to couch that ribbon in place and it's going to keep it all held in position for me. I could do this with marked lines. I could do it, um, you know, with that grid as well if I wanted to. And I'm going to go a little longer on my stitch link too. That's kind of a common practice when I'm doing um, anything on bulkier fabric. You're gonna love the results with this. Again, check out what's available for your machine. It may be a foot that's called a ribbon sewing foot. Imagine how tricky it would be for me to have to keep this straight as I'm going along. I just let it go loose and free. I'll just go about halfway here. And it's gonna give me a perfect, perfect line of ribbon. And I can do multiple lines, I can do um, you know, uh, grid shaped, I can do outlines, I can do whatever I want with this, but it just creates really such a pretty, pretty effect. Let me turn it over to the wrong side. You can just see 
what that feather stitch looks like. Um, for this particular width of ribbon, I used a width of four and a length of three. Again, you always want to test out some samples uh, and see what, what you like best. Using a matching thread is my preferred choice, but you can certainly um, use the contrast. And when you use a contrast, then it's the it's not the ribbon that really is accented, it's more the stitching. So think about that. All right, I've got another option for uh, embellishing with cording. And that is with a foot that's called a three slot cording foot. And by the way, um, for almost all of these feet that I've shown you so far, you can find a tutorial, either a video or a written or possibly both on my Let's Go Sew with Joanne Banco YouTube channel, on my Let's Go Sew.com website, and also uh, there are many of them on the Brother Stitching Social site because I was did a lot of tutorials um, for them. So what I've done is I've taken ordinary pearl cotton and I have guided that pearl cotton into all three slots of this three slot cording foot. You could use just the center, you could use just the sides. I've chosen to use all three. And I've got this to show you and then just one more and we're gonna be finished with all of this fun. First tip I wanna give you is once you've guided those cords through and they just snap right under, is to go ahead and tie yourself a knot in the back. If you don't have that knot there and you accidentally pull those threads forward, guess what's gonna happen? They're all gonna pull out. So do yourself a favor, get it um, in the slots and then get your knot back there. That's one of my best tips of the day. Now we'll go ahead and snap this one on. I can use the same type of couching stitches that I would use for, for ribbon. I can use a feather stitch. You might have on your machine stitches that are actually called um, couching. So I actually have one that's called couching, uh, tape attaching, but just about anything's game. Make sure that the that the stitch is relatively open, meaning it doesn't have a tight um, type of, of satin stitches, because if it does, you're, you're going to build up too much bulk on your fabric. And really, all we want to do is anchor this cording down. So again, I'm just going to use the width of the presser foot, but I could use marked lines. And I've just got my machine set for a couching stitch. I'm going to increase the length. I almost always increase the length when I do this technique. And ideally, you want it to skip on both the right and the left and catch everything in the process. So as you're doing your test piece, change your stitch width until it jumps from right to left and completely catches all of those threads. All right, I think that's enough to show you. Now, isn't that a beautiful thing? You could see how when I change the width, um, and in the early stages here, I didn't have it quite set wide enough, so I was losing one of those cords. But when I changed the width, I had all three cords anchored down. So just imagine, you can do this on your biani projects. You can do it in combination with your quilting, or you can do it all by itself. And it's ideal for fabrics that are uh, plain or have a tone-on-tone -tone print, and maybe you're looking for a certain color, you can't find it in a print, or you want just a, a kind of an elevated, elegant, but maybe more tone on tone look or just a, you know, a textured look. This adds texture. One more attachment that I have that will add texture is actually called a um, couching. And I'm not gonna stitch this one. I'll just kind of walk you through it. This actually will couch down yarn connected to my digital dual feed foot. So I have an option for um, a foot that has a tiny hole in it and that uh, yarn or cording would go as long as it fits in that hole it's fair game for stitching the same type of stitches that we did here the only difference is my machine actually has guides for it to hold onto, and um, it again gives me the benefit of having that that belt driven foot so if you have this foot and you have this option again consider couching um, yarn or cording so I think that's all I have for you today. I'm going to go ahead and switch back over 
and see what kind of questions we have, see what the chat's been up to, see what Annie has to say. All Let right. Me get back over here in front of the camera. Whew, All right. Another drink. While you're doing that, wow, Joanne, that I'm was back. awesome. You gave me so many ideas. I've got my little sheet of paper here with all the all the feet I want to look for. I have never ever heard of a dynamic walking foot with roller in it. So that was really exciting to hear about. I have done couching. Yeah. I'd forgotten about it though. Okay. And that really um, got me interested in maybe doing some couching on borders and things that go on projects. Yes. Yeah. So, so many ways you could do that. So thank you for that. I did have one thing that I wanted to clarify when we were talking okay. earlier about the quarter inch foot. I use the quarter inch foot for assembly, but anytime I'm quilting, I do do the walking foot, just like you said. So the quarter uh -huh. inch foot gotcha. is what I switched to. What I meant when we were talking is I see people using the walking foot when they're doing assembly. And I always use the quarter no, inch foot yeah. for that. And really, we should talk about that because the walking foot um, is great for so many things, <laughs> but it is not great for standard construction. And that's because the foot itself, no matter what type, is so wide that it ends up falling off the edge that you're trying to stitch on. So right. it's better in a broad area where it's going to have full contact with with the fabric and it really is your best friend forever when you're quilting but um, for construction we have so many other options i really like for construction using that straight stitch foot believe it or not um, because it gives you so much control, control. and yeah and again you know many of these feet are available for many many machines some of it's specialized some of it's particular to a certain a certain brand or a certain model but the, the the foot world is a big world and you need to explore it if you really want to expand your repertoire. That's my That's idea. for sure. <laughs> One thing that I did want to ask you, so when you did the mesh and the fold over, that was really cool. Uh -huh. And you said that was the adjustable bias foot, but it seems like you said that was the same name that you did when you did the top stitching on the handle. Did I misunderstand or was that the same foot? Um, either that or I misspoke. The, the, the mesh was done with the adjustable bias binder foot. Uh -huh. the, uh, the top stitching was done with the adjustable blind hem foot blind hem foot okay maybe blind i heard wrong foot. too and, and then the yeah. other question i had is when you did this i liked that idea on the handle with the three inch or three and a half probably three and a quarter is my guess but um yeah i should measure it when you did the stitching it. down the middle do you do it from the back where you see that or do you do it from the front no. and how do you know you're in the middle uh, well, the, that's a good question. Usually I do the two outside edges first uh -huh. and then just line it up by my eye um, for where. And are you, you know, doing it so from the front the or the, where, where it's flat? I always or from do it the... from the front. Okay. I do it from the front. Yep, and so it it, when you press it over, you know it's going to be more than halfway, so you're going to catch it. Correct. Exactly. Perfect. Exactly. I'm, gonna, I'm so excited again, to try that. You could use, um, the, actually, you know what, your walking foot would be ideal for doing for that. that part because it is a little wider. And uh -huh. then just move, you know, follow an edge and move your needle until your needle falls in the center. So you could take your marker and just mark the center a little bit, you know, because you can you measure going. and then mark so that you've got it, you know, accurate and then use your, your, your foot for the rest of it. That yeah, would probably that's... be what I would do. I can eyeball it. But um, I was trained to eyeball a lot of things in fashion school. Your eye becomes, I know exactly what a quarter inch looks like. I know exactly what three eighths looks like. I know exactly what three quarters looks like because my eye is trained for that. Trained to but do that. anytime you have an edge guide um, or a foot that makes it easier for you to maintain the status quo there, you are it's ahead be of the easier. game. For sure. All right, so we do have some questions from other people too. So let's just get started. Great. I thought the Luminaire did both embroidery and sewing. Is it strictly embroidery? It is a an embroidery and sewing combination machine. Great. Yes, it's a combo machine. So I had it set up for sewing only today. 
to embroider on that machine, we add an embroidery unit. It all comes with the machine, but it, it, is, it is what we call a combo machine. And there are other machines in the brother world and similar <laughs> um, clone machines that have that uh, digital dual feed capability um, yeah, that, that are sewing only. Okay. So All you right. don't have to have an embroidery machine in order to have that foot. Let me grab the foot real quick. This is available on sewing only models as well as some of the combo models. So definitely worth looking into. Yeah, um, I'm gonna, walking I'm foot gonna with superpowers. Yeah, I loved that. And, and you know, I, I do want to mention one thing, um, Annie. I know that um, a lot of, I can't have trouble getting in the right spot here with you. A lot of people that, that are big buy any bag makers use a straight stitch machine. And I understand that fully because, you, you know, what did I do? I switched to a straight stitch plate and a straight stitch throat to make my zigzag do it all machine act like a straight stitch machine. So I, to me then I have the best of both worlds. Um, and if you do have a machine that has some decorative capabilities with decorative stitches and zigzag, um, it again, with combination with feet, it just expands your repertoire, so. Amen, for sure. So the next question was, do you use a stabilizer before you you layer your fabric with the soft and stable? And I think they may be thinking of where you showed the stabilizer when you were do doing the decorative stitches. Yep, I only do that when I do decorative stitches because when I do those decorative stitches, I don't I I personally don't want to stitch my decorative stitches through soft and stable. That that little bit of smush factor that you get can distort many decorative stitches. stitches. Now you could try it, but um, my most successful method is to stabilize my single layer of top fabric, well stabilized. Usually I just use a tearaway stabilizer. Um, you can use starch, you can use material magic, you can use whatever you want, but you want that fabric to feel more like paper when you're doing those decorative stitches. And then you are assured that your decorative stitches are gonna form with perfection. And then match it up with your decorative stitch foot that's designed for your machine. When you're done with your decorative stitching, add your by any soft and stable, add your backing, and then do your quilting. And from the top side, it looks like you did everything at once, but the back side tells the true story because story. you don't see those decorative stitches on the back side. They're only done through one layer. layer. That makes perfect sense. Next question was, do you need a larger needle for the Wonderfill thread? Um, you definitely need a top stitch needle for the Wonderfill. I believe they recommend a size 14, um, which is exactly what I used. Um, okay. They may, rec you know, you can always size up to a 16, but um, I, I believe that Wonderfill themselves recommends a size 14 top stitch needle for 12 weight thread. Okay. And I've had success with that. Great. Um, how much extra fabric do you leave on the sides if you are using crosshatch quilting? Like when you make your uh, sandwich, do you allow an inch or two or? Uh, very little, very little. If you're, if you're, you know, testing your piece first to see, you know, and you're, if you need to make any adjustments, even using a longer stitch length will make that um, stitch better. Um, you're going to lose very little. It, the, really, the amount depends on the size of the fabric. For okay. most of the by any projects, um, what do you recommend as we far as We usually allow needs? two inches on the larger pieces. And if it's just, you know, if you're cutting individual pieces, one inch is plenty. Yeah, to, I'd say that's perfect. I I've would, never had I it shrink say, more than that, and I've always yeah, had room to yeah. trim. Okay. It, it, it's amazing. I've done whole quilts, like whole quilts and measured before and after. And when you're doing um, you know, any type of quilting or fill stitching, you really lose very, very little. It's, uh, it's amazing, even on a big piece. So piece. extra insurance is always a good thing, a little more rather than a little less, but usually you can get away with very little on those outside edges. Sounds good. Someone's asking what the equivalent of the Brother Overcasting Foot is on a Bernina. I would recommend that they check with the Bernina dealer because I'm not sure and I'm guessing you aren't either. And then no, do you but need I, to... I, Go back, Glow. 
I believe that's need... a very standard type foot. It may even come with my, it may even come pre-packed with your machine. Yeah, I kind of think I have an overcast foot. It looked very similar to that. So I need to look in my book of feet and, and see what it's called. And maybe I'll try and answer that by next week. Do you need okay. to use an overcast zigzag foot or a regular, let's see, do you need to use an overcast zigzag or a regular zigzag with the overcast foot? Great, great, great question. You can do it with a regular foot, but you have to guide the fabric perfectly all along the way. With that, if you know, if you, somebody goes back and watches the video and they'll see my, my fabric was butted up right against that little um, uh, extended toe on that overcasting foot, so I could, I could do no wrong. It perfectly, perfectly zigzagged it. right on the edge. Yeah, and that's and a so great way to, easier. to seal your edges. Did, is that oh, a particular I mean, stitch that you're using, or is it a... Just a regular, um, ordinary zigzag. zigzag. Just an ordinary okay. zigzag, and I did give the width and the length setting that I, that I used. You want it to be less than a quarter of an inch um, as far as the bite because you don't want it to show when you sew your final seams. You're just swooshing down that outside edge and anchoring all those layers together and keeping your fabric from raveling at the same time. I mean, how right. good is that? Which is so nice, yeah. And then um, one more question, is the clapper made out of a special type of wood? Oh, that's a great question, yes. Um, I will give a little plug for my, my friend, Angela Wolf. Uh, that's where I got that clapper. She has them custom made from a hardwood in Michigan. So it's all made in, in, in the United States and in Michigan in particular. Um, any clapper that you will find will be made to withstand that type of heat, but they are made with a very high density um, wood. I believe that one is maple, if I'm correct. I, th I have one, I think it might be oak. It might be maple too, but okay. um, they're really nice. Yes. I like them too. Oh. The other questions it's, that came in were all changer. about special feet and i would again just as joanne said check with your dealer for the machine you have and and find out what they have there so good and thank you, you. If you do have the same type of machine that i have or uh you know or a clone basically you know everybody out there knows what a clone is if that if you have one um feel free to contact me uh let's go sew.com i click right on my contact and i will very happily answer you and help you if I can. If it's outside my brand, I may not, I may not know the answer, but I'm always, always willing to help. And while you're there at the website, please sign up for my email list. I would love to have you on my um, weekly email list. I send out what I call a love note every weekend, and it's just a little bit of sewing chat, letting you know what's going on. If there's a new live show coming out, if I've got a new video done, whatever's going on it's just a it's a letter from a sewing friend so I'd love to have you on board that's awesome thank you so much Joanne it was such a treat to spend time with you today and to learn from your experience because you've got it all the way across the board and we really appreciate that you made time to be with us so thank you oh, and I will look forward to, to seeing again. you again sometime soon Okay, I'd love to be back, and I'd love to have you back on my show as well. So we got a good, Let's make it good thing going here. <laughs> All right. Happy sewing. Bye-bye. Bye. Go ahead and go down. Go. All right. So um, I just want to um, let you know that all that information that Joanne shared was so fabulous. We also have some really good resources on our website um, for things related to machines and feet. In particular, uh, be sure to check out the Live with Annie that we did in season two. It was episode seven and it was titled Essential Tools, basically, which to me was a sewing machine and feet. So in that episode, I talked about what I look for when I'm choosing a machine, things like needle down, things like that, and the different feet that I recommend. So remember too that with our new website, if you type machine or feet or tools in the search box, box you're in addition to products you're now going to get information about blogs answers to frequently asked questions that relate to those topics so you're going to find some good information there now too and as always any of the things that we talked about today 
ask for them at your local quilt shop or your local machine dealer. They are such an important part of our sewing communities and it's up to all of us to keep them strong and vibrant. And again, if there were feet she showed and you've got a different machine, go to your dealer, explain to them what she was doing and see if they can provide that for you. So. Also, um, before we go, don't forget to stay tuned at the end for our um, little preview of the local quilt shops. You can go ahead and go down, Glow, um, that we um, featured on social media this week. All of these shops currently have Biani trunk shows on display and um, Biani products in their stores, so be sure to stop in and check them out. And thank you again to everyone who joined us today. We are going to be back next Wednesday at 2 p.m. Mountain Time with another fun episode of Live with Annie when we're going to be joined by the amazing Amy Berkman to talk about upcycling and her Treasured Threads collection. So Amy's going to share her passion for vintage textiles and ways to use her fun fabric panels as whole cloth projects or pieced into Biani projects. So until then, Happy stitching! Hi, I'm Annie from ByAnnie.com and Patterns by Annie, and today I am thrilled to talk about Pins and Needles Sewing Shops of Middleburg Heights, Ohio. Meet Jan Brostek, a sewing industry veteran whose dedication has shaped the story of pins and needles. Jan founded the original store in Middleburg Heights in 1988, just two weeks after welcoming her second child, Bree. After years of operating multiple locations, the family acquired the current building in 2012, consolidating into one wonderful space to welcome sewing enthusiasts. Today, Jan, alongside her husband Jim and their three children, leads Pins and Needles with a focus on top-tier sewing education and community engagement. Their vision extends beyond physical boundaries through Sew It Online, offering virtual classes to inspire makers far and wide. Now let's step into this beautiful shop. Nestled in the heart of Middleburg Heights, Ohio, the store spans an impressive 20,000 square feet, occupying a prominent corner on Bagley and Pearl. With a layout designed to cater to their customers' every need, from a spacious sales floor showcasing a wide array of products, to a dedicated space for events and classes, Pins and Needles is a beacon of creativity and community. Their state-of-the-art film studio buzzes with energy as they produce captivating online classes, complementing their in-person workshops and enriching activities. And with their expansive warehouse housing every brand of machine they offer, along with a bustling service department, they are here to support their customers every step of the way. Pins and Needles offers a diverse range of products and services tailored to meet the needs of sewing enthusiasts of all levels. With an impressive lineup of brands, they ensure that their customers have access to the latest innovations in the industry. Their calendar boasts over 60 classes each quarter, covering everything from events and usage classes to free demonstrations. And with their on-site service department staffed by four full-time technicians, over 1,000 bolts of fabric, and a large outlet center with fabric at 50% off, there is something for everyone. If you're in the area, be sure to mark your calendars for the upcoming OSQE event at the IAC Center in Cleveland on April 18th, 19th, and 20th, where they'll be showcasing over 20 booths. They practically move the entire store for this expo. Plus, don't miss their exciting lineup of events in the coming months, including workshops with renowned instructors like Alyssa Sicardi, a Free Spirit Fabric Circle of Makers brand ambassador, and Orophil Artisan. From kids' camp to thread painting with IQ designer My Design Center, there is something for everyone to enjoy at Pins and Needles. They are also hosting a fabulous Biani trunk show, featuring models based on some of our most popular travel bag patterns and more. As we wrap up, I'd like to extend a warm invitation to visit Pins and Needles Sewing Shops and experience the magic for yourself. 
Until next time, happy stitching! and Patterns by Annie. Today I am thrilled to shine the spotlight on Quilt Mercantile, nestled in the charming town of Celeste, Texas. The regional winner of the 2023 LQS contest for the state of Texas, they are currently part of the All Texas Shop Hop, which takes place in March and April 2024. And they have a Biani trunk show on display now through the first week of May. Jennifer Tenney and her mom Vicki Dees opened this fabulous quilt shop over 20 years ago in October 2002. Fast forward to 2019 and Jennifer's husband Devin hopped on board to expand their sewing machine and service departments. What a great family project! Now let's talk shop. Picture this. A whopping 5,400 square feet housing over 3,600 bolts of fabric. Whether you are into traditional prints or have a more modern taste, Quilt Mercantile has something to spark your creativity. And as it turns out, the town of Celeste has plenty in the way of artistic inspiration too. Celeste High School has an excellent art department which has invested time and talent into creating murals in various places around town. Now, mark your calendars because Quilt Mercantile has a great lineup of upcoming events. Check out their retreat calendar at quilttagesquarters.com for a peek at educator-led retreats featuring big names like Judy Niemeyer, Quiltworks, Pearl Piera, and embroidery experts like Kimber Bell and Embrilliance. And don't forget that they are part of the All Texas Shop Hop in March and April. With the goal to provide the best value in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, they are offering 10% off MSRP on all in-store fabric purchases and a whopping 20% off MSRP on books and patterns. Visiting their shop will also be a great chance to see some fabulous Biani models made from patterns such as Undercover, Flipping Out, Project Bags 2.0, Ruler Wrap, Take a Stand, and Running with Scissors. So if you're in the area, head on over to Quilt Mercantile, get inspired, and don't forget to tell them Annie sent you. Let's make some sewing magic happen in Celeste, Texas. Happy stitching! from byannie.com and Patterns by Annie. Today I am pleased to introduce a wonderful local quilt shop, so inspired quilt shop and studio of Simsbury, Connecticut. First, let me share a bit about the fabulous woman behind this shop. Meet Viv, a sewing veteran with over 40 years of experience under her belt. From creating garments to art quilts, Viv's expertise knows no bounds. In 2005, Viv opened So Inspired Quilt Shop and Studio, leaving behind a 21-year corporate career in graphic design and marketing communications to pursue her passion. Committed to fostering community and inspiration, Viv equips new quilters and sewists with technical skills and confidence, wherever they may be on their creative journey. When not sewing, Viv enjoys knitting, reading, gardening, and cooking. A lifelong resident of Simsbury, she resides there with her husband of 40 years, and they have three children and three grandchildren. Now let's check out the shop. Situated in the Fiddler's Green Complex at the heart of Simsbury, Connecticut, So Inspired draws quilters from across New England. This suburban gem, nestled in the Farmington Valley, exudes the historic charm of a New England community despite recent development. With a diverse range of fabrics from traditional prints to cutting edge designer collections, So Inspired is a premier destination for quilters seeking inspiration. At So Inspired, visitors discover professionally finished samples showcasing a range of styles, from contemporary art quilts to traditional designs, bags, and clothing. 
With an average production of three quilts and numerous smaller projects monthly, the studio is a hub of creativity. Renowned for their long arm expertise, So Inspired is an award-winning handy quilter dealer, offering comprehensive support through classes, clubs, and machine quilting services. So Inspired will host its annual Handy Quilter Van Event in August of 2024. This is a hands-on event designed for quilters who want to learn how easy it is to finish their own quilts. You can also catch a Biani trunk show from now until May 4th, showcasing models made from our popular switchback and payday wallet purse patterns. I hope you've enjoyed this glimpse into the world of Sew Inspired Quilt Shop and Studio. With its thriving community of sewists, this place is a testament to the power of passion and creativity. Be sure to stop by and tell them Annie sent you. Happy stitching!